It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker, and this question is for the Premier. I have asked this government multiple times to clear up their relationship with Atlas Strategic Advisors and the Premier's former Principal Secretary, Amin Masoudi. The same Amin Masoudi who was on the infamous boys' trip to Vegas. Masoudi was paid through his private company, Atlas, nearly a quarter of a million dollars to do the same job when he, as when he was the Premier's Principal Secretary. Yet this government has refused to answer questions on just exactly when that contract started, so I am going to try again. My question to the Premier is, can you finally clarify when the contract with Atlas Strategic Advisors started? To reply, the government house leader. Well, I'll, uh, I'll answer again, Mr. Speaker. The contract started after uh, Mr. Masoudi uh, uh, was no longer employed by the Premier's uh, office and after he reached out to the Integrity Commissioner to clear the work. Supplementary question. Speaker, it's a simple question that merits a simple answer. Speaker, when did the contract Order. start? People want to know, Speaker, yeah. because the Premier's office told media that the contract started on, Here. and I quote, about July 1, 2022. And that matters because through an FOI, the official opposition NDP obtained documents that show Mr. Masoudi was going to meetings as the Premier's principal secretary as late as August 23, 2022. Wow. That's a two-month overlap between when Mr. Masoudi started billing the taxpayers through his company and while he himself was still on the government payroll speaker. So back to the Premier, was the Premier's close friend paid twice to perform the same work? The government house leader. No. The final supplementary. Speaker, it really shouldn't be so difficult. It's not just the dates that were concerned about. Stop the clock. Okay, order. Member for Brampton North will come to order. The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. We're just getting started. Restart the clock. Leader of the Opposition. A bit cranky today. Uh, speaker, it's not just the dates that we're concerned about, because while Mr. Masoudi's company, Atlas Strategic Advisors, was billing the Premier's office for speech writing, that same company was lobbying the government on behalf of numerous private interests related to the Greenbelt grab. Wow. In fact, the Integrity Commissioner has been looking into this. They've been, and I quote, looking into Atlas Strategic Advisors for allegations of illegal lobbying since June. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. Why was a close friend of the Premier awarded a contract to write speeches at the same time that they were actively lobbying this government? Members will take their seats. Order. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Government House Leader can reply. Uh, but really, the standing ovation really isn't for me, right? It's not for me. The Leader of the Opposition says that I'm cranky, but why would I be cranky when last Thursday there was a motion in front of this House, a motion of confidence in the government, and you know what happened, colleagues? 100 per cent confidence in the government. Not one member stood in their place. Wait for it. Not one. Not one member of the opposition stood in their place to vote against the government. Not one said that they did not have confidence in the government. It was a historic vote. But, colleagues, that has happened once before in the history of the province. You know when that was? In the last parliament. With the we're engaging in a conversation here. Uh, uh, the government House Leader has the floor. Yeah. Sure, Speaker, I'll go through you to them, because had you been able to vote, I'm sure you also would have had the exact same confidence in the government that 100 per cent of this legislature Response. had, Mr. Speaker. It was an historic vote. I appreciate the confidence from the Leader of the Opposition. I appreciate the confidence from the third party. A historic vote, and we'll continue on. Stop the clock. Order. 
Order. Start the clock. The next question. Leader of the Opposition. I have another question for the Premier. Today, Ontario Place for All is filing an injunction to stop the environmental vandalism at Ontario Place, including the destruction of 800 mature trees. The clear cutting at Ontario Place should have been part of an environmental assessment, but the government conveniently exempted it, saying it was a privately led development. Speaker, it is abundantly clear the Ontario government is running the show at Ontario Place, so an environmental assessment should have been done. So will the Premier order a full environmental assessment of the Ontario Place project? And to respond, the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, we've conducted two environmental assessments, one on the site servicing work that is necessary in order to make sure that we can have tenants on the site. And Mr. Speaker, good news, we actually completed our Category C environmental assessment on Friday. Uh, it will be made public. It, will, it is shared with the public, Mr. Speaker. But what's most important, we are bringing Ontario Place back to life. No one goes to Ontario Anymore. The site is deteriorating. The site is flooding. In fact, Live Nation had to cancel its concerts in, back in 2017 because of the flooding issues. We will make sure that we improve the shoreline. We will make sure that there will be lots of family, lots of activities for families to do at Ontario Place. If it was up to the NDP, they would do nothing. No. They would let the site deteriorate Response? and let the site continue to flood. But we will not let that happen. Supplementary question. Tell you what we wouldn't do, Speaker. We wouldn't sign a 95-year lease. In fact, Speaker, the government's hands are all over the Ontario Place redevelopment. They're so hell-bent on this private luxury spa that they're ignoring municipal bylaws, claiming they don't apply to them. The government is threatening to use provincial powers to expropriate city-owned land to ram their luxury spa project through. The government is trying to have it both ways. Will the Premier stop the environmental destruction at Ontario Place and order a full environmental assessment? Members of please take their seats. The Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what Ontario Place looks like right now. First of all, it is mostly paved. It's mostly paved. The marina is rusting. The island is flooding. Mr. Speaker, this is not a place where people bring their families anymore. That is just the reality of the situation. And Mr. Speaker, we have a competitive opposition come to order. process where Thermae Wellness Facility participated and was successful, and now they will be an active tenant on the site that will contribute to the annual maintenance of the site to make sure that it does not fall into disrepair like it has done under their watch. John. They closed Ontario Place. John, you were we watching. are going to bring it back to life with They're wonderful liberals. activities uh, to make sure that we bring the site uh, to good standards so that families can enjoy it for years like and years here. to come. The final supplementary. In fact, Speaker, 2.1 million Ontarians visited Ontario Place last year. That's that's more. Yeah, and and and, and it's flooding. It's flooding. So the government solution is put in an underground parking garage. I mean, everything about this deal is fishy. This government has gone so far above and beyond for this luxury spa company. It smacks of preferential treatment. They're going out of their way to avoid scrutiny. They signed a 95-year lease with Therma, but won't share the details with Ontarians. They're putting in at least a half billion dollars into this, and it seems like it was all a setup from the beginning. The deal reeks. So to the premier. Do we have to wait for another Auditor General, General report or the RCMP to get the details? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Infrastructure. For everyone here knows that the people that do go to Ontario Place are going there to enjoy the concerts provided by Live Nation. Exactly. And Mr. Speaker, included in our redevelopment plans is a brand new stage that will be operational all year round so that the public can enjoy more concerts at concerts. Ontario Place. And Order. Mr. Speaker, if my memory serves me correct, I mean, the City of Toronto just passed a motion asking for the Wellness Centre to be moved at Exhibition Place. But do you know what, what one of their arguments was for that? Oh, because there's parking. Parking is a necessity when it comes to tourist, uh, tourist attractions. Wanderland. Order. Every 
tourist attraction, the zoo has parking. We want to make it as accessible for people so that the mom from Scarborough with three kids can make it down to Ontario Place to Response. enjoy. The NDP against the <laughs> Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, Walter Kem, a prominent landscape architect who designed Trillium and Tommy Thompson Parks, has withdrawn his support from the Ontario Place redevelopment project. Mr. Kem is speaking out against the Premier's environmental vandalism at Ontario Place, including the clear-cutting of 800 mature trees and the habitats that they support in order to make way for a government-subsidized private luxury spa. The Auditor General has already announced an investigation of the Ontario Place scheme, and now Mr. Kem says the public needs to know the truth about the harm this project will cause. Will the Premier halt his environmental vandalism at Ontario Place? Once again, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Pe uh, Mr. Speaker. This is a wonderful opportunity to talk about all of the environmental improvements that we are making at Ontario Place. For example, we will have 50 acres of free public realm and park space for the wow, public to enjoy. That's we great. will have aquatic habitat, wetlands, and improved water quality at Ontario Place. And again, to reiterate, Mr. Speaker, we will have shoreline improvements and enhancements to protect the island for generations to come so that our children, our grandchildren, have a wonderful place to go all year round. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, the plan that you have, there was no environmental assessment, and your plan is actually to cut down, to clear cut 800 mature trees and destroy the habitat for 125 bird species and other wildlife. And there was no environmental assessment because this, because this is just because this, the government announced, the, just before they announced the call for the Ontario Place redevelopment, it made regulatory changes that exempted this project from the Environmental Assessment Act. Did the government? make those changes so the public would not know the truth about the environmental vandalism the Premier was planning at Ontario Place. <clears throat> Members will take their seats. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To add to my pre previous comments, we will be adding a 6 to 1 ratio on trees. Uh, for larger trees and a two to one ratio for smaller trees. In fact, there will be far more vegetation on the on Ontario Place once fully redeveloped than today. But Mr. Speaker, let's ask what their plan is. Do you know what the plan of the NDP is? Let it crumble. Do nothing. Don't build subways, don't build highways, don't build schools, don't build long-term care, and don't bring Ontario Order. Place back to life. No wonder no one supports your party. No members to make their comments to the chair. The next question, the member for Brantford, Brent, the House will come to order. 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 The member for Brantford, Brant has a question he wants to ask. The member for Brantford, Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. The Bank of Canada has confirmed what the Premier and our government have been saying for years. The carbon tax is raising the price of everything. After years of pushing energy costs higher, the Prime Minister has finally announced that the federal government is pausing the carbon tax, but only on home heating oil and only for three years. Speaker, this is a serious issue for many Ontarians as costs continue to soar. I've heard from many of my constituents over the weekend who heat with natural gas or propane who are concerned that the federal Liberals are leaving them out in the cold this winter. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax is negatively impacting the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Once again, the member opposite is correct. The Bank of Canada has confirmed that Canadians are paying more um, for carbon tax, and they're worse off because of the carbon tax than they were prior to its arrival here in Canada and in Ontario. The federal government's admitted so because of what the member opposite mentioned. They've realized that it's costing Atlantic Canadians more, so they've carved out home heating fuel in Atlantic Canada, but they've left 
those who heat here in Ontario and the rest of Canada holding the bag with higher costs of living, Mr. That's Speaker. The Liberals are fully aware that the carbon tax is costing Canadians more. So why won't they do the right thing, Mr. Speaker? Why won't they do what the member opposite is suggesting? Make it cheaper for everybody across Canada to heat their homes this winter, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. I appreciate that. It seems that there is now broad recognition that the carbon tax costs families much more than what they will ever get back. However, this recognition does little to help people who are struggling to pay high heating costs. In fact, the Parliamentary Budget Officer confirmed that by 2030, the carbon tax will cost families over $2,000 per year, even with climate rebates. And that's why, Speaker, it was so surprising to hear a member of the Liberal Caucus rise in this House to repeat the claim that families are better off because of the carbon tax? No. Speaker, no. can the minister please Order. elaborate on the effects of the carbon tax on individuals and families across the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Speaker, he was shocked. I was shocked too. I couldn't believe it last Thursday when a member of the Ontario Liberal Party stood in her place and, and I believe the exact quote was, families are better off now thanks to the carbon tax when they were than they were before it was introduced, Mr. Speaker. If the federal Liberals are starting to realize that Canadians, in fact, aren't better off because of the carbon tax, it's amazing to me that members of the Ontario Liberal Caucus, and let's be honest, it shrunk significantly because of energy issues over the last five or six years, Mr. Speaker, but it's shocking to me that a member of the Ontario Liberal Party would stand in her place and say that families in Ontario are better off now than they were prior to the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't make any sense. I wonder, this party is Order. down to a handful of members, Mr. Respond. Speaker. When are they finally going to come to the realization that it's their job to stand up for Ontario families like this party is doing? Order. The next question, member for London North Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. $15 billion in public funds have been committed to build the Next Star battery plant in Windsor, with a third of that committed by the province. On this side of the House, we welcome that investment and the good jobs that are supposed to come with it. So, Stellantis LG is potentially looking to have international workers build and staff the plant, a pretty big loophole if the province missed it. Speaker, the government's going to point fingers in state borders or federal, but what is this government doing right now? to protect long-term Ontarian jobs at Nexstar. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I, I first want to say, uh, Speaker, we're excited about the world-class EV uh, battery manufacturing that's taking place in Ontario, thanks to the leadership of this Premier and this Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, uh, Minister of Economic Development and I have, have asked a very simple question. We've written to the federal government and asked them to disclose the number of foreign workers currently working uh, on the site and how many will be arriving at the site via the labour market impact assessment. And then we just asked simply that the federal government disclose the labour market impact the labour impact assessment, make it public, and just share with Ontarians how many uh, foreign workers they expect to arrive. We know there's going to be thousands of on good Ontario unionized jobs created on this site, Speaker, and it's no thanks to the members opposite. We're creating those jobs thanks to investments this government's making. And I look forward to Response. explaining to the member from Windsor West uh, next about more work this great government's doing to invest in jobs. Supplementary, the member for Windsor West. The, uh, back to the Premier, the Minister should actually thank the workers in Windsor and the union that helped negotiate yeah. that deal over years. Here, back to the Premier. This Conservative government had two different opportunities to get this deal right, and they still missed the mark. Windsor workers have been left behind because it didn't even occur to the Conservatives to tie the investment commitments to our local workforce. As many as 1,600 workers from outside the country are reportedly on their way to work on the plant. Windsor is excited to be the home of the future battery plant. The people of Windsor have the skills and experience to do the work. 
Speaker, why did the Premier fail to ensure that Windsor workers would be at the forefront of these good-paying union jobs and fail to have the proper protections in writing for the next arm battery plant deal? Members may please take their seats. Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much. That member knows, just as every, every member of this legislature, that there's going to be great unionized jobs created on that site, and we're looking forward to it. You know, Speaker, I've got the letter. I've got the letter from that member opposite where she meanders to talk about MZOs. But there's one thing we do agree about. This $15 billion project is of huge significance to my community, our province, and our country. What that member fails to recognize is the very MZO she talks about in this letter, we issued one to get that record investment in her community. Secondly, secondly, Speaker, secondly, this minister, this premier, have been working around the clock to land these deals. No thanks to them. They voted Order. against every single measure in this Order. place to support workers in her own community. Those workers know the only time they'll see that member is when she and her seatmate show up Spons. for the photo op. Speaker, they can decry everything they want, notwithstanding the decent photo op, because that's what NDP stands for. They only show up for the photo op. The House will come to order. The next question. Order. Member for Niagara Falls will come to order. Member for Brampton North will come to order. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. We've seen a record number of investments come into our province since we took office because we have kept costs low for businesses. In the auto sector, we have attracted generational investments that are building Ontario's end-to-end -end EV supply chain and creating tens of thousands of jobs in the process. But rather than supporting our low tax agenda, the NDP and Liberals in this House continue to support the federal government's carbon tax. They will never miss an opportunity to support tax increases as they are doing with the federal carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is positioning Ontario as a global powerhouse in EV production by keeping costs low? The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Brantford Brant will come to order. The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade can reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, we have to think about where we were in 2018. Speaker, we had lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. The Liberals, supported by the NDP, had left Ontario completely unprepared. In fact, in 2019, Reuters announced there would be $300 billion spent on the EV supply chain, and not one penny of it was scheduled to come to Canada. Not one penny of it. Our government took office, reduced the cost of doing business by $8 billion annually, and as a direct result, in our negotiations with all of the companies, we landed $27 billion worth of auto Response. and EV. Bloomberg has announced us as the number two global supply chain, wow. and that's because we kept taxes low. Supplementary question. Member. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his dedicated work for this province. Under the previous Liberal government, years of high taxes and endless red tape led to countless businesses to pack up and leave that province. Thankfully, from the first day we took office, we've been focused on lowering costs for businesses, which is why we've seen record investment in job creation across the province. Yet last week, a Liberal member in this House spoke in support of a federal carbon tax, a tax, a tax that's making everything more expensive for businesses. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the federal government's plan to continue hiking the carbon tax will affect Ontario's businesses? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker. Uh, 
you heard my in my uh, original answer we talked about how unprepared the liberals had left this province we have changed all that for the past five out of the past six years we are now ontario is now the number one in the site selection in all of north america this is where people want to be the Liberals lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. They wanted us out of manufacturing and into the service sec sector. They jeopardized our competitiveness. They tripled the carbon tax. They are tripling the carbon tax by 2030. They're going to add 37 cents a litre. They're going to continue to jeopardize our competitiveness, just like they did for the 15 years that they are on offers. Speaker, we cannot go back Spons? to the days of the Liberal tax and spend. That's why we want them to axe the carbon tax. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. On several occasions, the legal sector magazine Canadian Lawyer has raised legitimate concerns about this government's pattern of politicizing the judicial appointment process. Internal government documents show that on November 19, 2021, the Attorney General was notified of an imminent judicial vacancy in Cornwall. This provided more than enough time for the Attorney General to work with the Judicial Appointment Advisory Committee, a nonpartisan and respected advisory body, and choose from the committee's highly qualified and vetted list of candidate recommendations. Speaker, it's been two years since that notification, and Cornwall still is one short, short one sitting judge. Is the Attorney General ignoring the committee's advice because his Conservative candidate choice was not on the list of qualified and vetted recommendations? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the, the Judicial Advisory Committee and, and how they work. I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, we've been working to make the system more transparent and more fair. Uh, it, talking about choice. When, when we came to government, Mr. Speaker, the committee would give two names to the Attorney General for choice. And, and they, would, they could get 100 applications, they could do 50 interviews, and two names would come forward. Those are the only two names that you would see. And in one occasion, uh, I got John Smith and John Smith in one location, and John Smith and John Smith in the other, effectively giving me a choice. Would you like vegetables? It's peas. That's it, Mr. Speaker. There was no choice. So we changed in 2021 to allow for six names per appointment, Mr. Speaker, because the Attorney General is charged with making that appointment. Now, Mr. Speaker, we've also made other changes to improve the process. We've been very open about, about our criteria. Now, Mr. Speaker, rather than the conspiracy theories that abound in the NDP, I would like to know which one of the 83 judges I have appointed that she doesn't like. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This government's years of political meddling with tribunal and judicial appointments are w very well documented now. The Attorney General himself admitted in a TVO interview that he should have the right and ability to appoint judges to reflect the same values as he. Same. Political interference has produced dire consequences for Ontario's justice system. Under this Conservative government, there have been record high tribunal wait lists, massive court Short, uh, staffing shortages, courtrooms literally falling apart, charges against violent offenders being tossed for unconditional court delays, and much more. Speaker, considering their insistent political meddling with tribunal and judicial appointments, the current criminal investigation of this Order. government for reported corruption, how can anyone from the legal community or the general public ever trust this government again? Minister of Education will come to order. The Attorney General can reply. Thank the opposite member for reading her rambling question, Mr. Speaker, because it covers a lot of ground. But what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, is that we work closely with the Ontario Bar Association, with the Law Society, with the Federation of Ontario Law Associations. We work with the Judiciary, Mr. Speaker, and the Judicial Advisory Appointments Committee, Mr. Speaker, is that. It's an advisory committee, Mr. Speaker. And of all of the, the Chief Justice, the Regional Senior Judges, the JPs, the Regional Senior JPs, the Associate Chief Justices, Mr. Speaker, and the 83 judges that this government has appointed, Mr. Speaker, I challenge the NDP to tell me one that is inappropriate, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Instead of building homes, your government has wasted time and money on the $8.3 billion Greenbelt scandal 
and enforce boundary expansions, which you are now reversing. Order. Housing starts are not on track, and the RCMP is closing in. Says Mr. Tomorrow will be exactly Order. one well year resident. since I tabled You're bills so to legalize <laughs> home building in existing communities <laughs> without paving over farmland and lining the pockets of speculators, saying no to expensive sprawl and saying yes in my backyard. So, Speaker, will the Premier say yes to my bills to legalize building fourplexes, walk-up apartments, and mid-rise housing so people can find a home they can afford in the communities they know and love? And to respond, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate that, but I think the member is, is, is incorrect. Uh, really, the policies that uh, have been ushered in by this, uh, by this government, uh, the significant housing supply action plans brought in uh, uh, by, uh, by the former minister, have actually helped us uh, increase housing starts across the province to their highest level. Uh, in over uh, ten, 10 years. In fact, uh, purpose-built rentals, because of those policies, are at, their, are at their highest level in over 15 years. Because of the policies that the Minister of, of Finance fought for to ensure that we took off the HST on uh, purpose-built rentals, the federal government finally, after a year, came on board and has, uh, and, and has matched that uh, speaker. So what we're doing is working with our municipal partners to get more shovels in the ground as quickly as we possibly can, removing the obstacles that the Liberals put in the way. Uh, speaker, and we're going to continue to do that. Our policies Response. are working, and they're working because we know how important it is to remove obstacles, to cut red tape, to reduce taxes so that people can get out of their pay parents' basement and into a brand new home for themselves. Thank you. Supplementary question. With all due respect to the Minister Speaker, the government is not on track to meet their housing goals. That's what the facts say. They've spent their time focused on helping well-connected speculators cash in instead of focusing in on building homes that ordinary people can afford Order. in the communities they want to live in. They've focused in on expensive sprawl which increases property taxes and makes commuting more expensive. I'm focused on building homes that ordinary people can afford in the communities they want to live in. So the government has an opportunity. Happy, happy to help them here. They have an opportunity to say yes to legalizing fourplexes four-story walk-up apartments and mid-rise developments so ordinary people can afford homes. Will they say yes to that? To reply, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I find it very ironic from the member from the Green Party saying all this. When he votes against every single piece of legislation we have to speed up development, to make sure that municipalities have all the tools they need to get things built. But I want to remind you, Mr. Speaker, once again, in his own riding, his own riding, they voted against student housing on Guelph University's property themselves. I never heard a word from him. Never heard a word from him. But maybe if Mr. Green comes on board and starts voting uh, for building homes and cutting out red tape and making things happen, uh, you're welcome to come to this Order. side of the aisle anytime. And I'll remind the members to refer to each other by their writing name or ministerial title as, a, as applicable. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. I hear that my constituents, I hear from my constituents that they want to be treated equally and fairly when it comes to the carbon tax. They see how the federal government has moved quickly to provide a pause on the carbon tax for Atlantic Canadians, and they are asking that Ontario be provided with the same opportunity. Speaker, I agree with my constituents. All forms of home heating in Ontario should be exempt. As winter approaches, home heating costs are top of mind for many families. Unfortunately, the independent Liberals and opposition NDP do not appreciate the hardship many Ontarians face because of the carbon tax. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax negatively impacts Ontarians who need financial relief? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Energy. 
Speaker, this seems like something that everyone in this House should be able to agree on, especially with winter on our doorstep, Mr. Speaker. Everybody should be able to agree that the carbon tax needs to take a pause for a while. But if they can't agree on that, Mr. Speaker, I think everybody here should be able to agree that affordability is an issue right now. And it's not because of anything that this government has done, because we brought forward so many different levers to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario, including uh, removing HST uh, off of home heating bills. That was a motion that was brought forward last week, and I was really happy uh, that our government house leader brought forward that motion to ask that the harmonized sales tax be removed from home heating for all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. It's something that everybody should be able to get by, especially at this time of year, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so Spots. I commend our government for standing up for the people of Ontario. Why won't the opposition Liberals do the same? And the supplementary question, back to the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. Along with the minister, I fully support the government house leader in calling on the federal government to at least pause the collection of HSD from home heating bills, even if they won't scrap the disastrous carbon tax. Ontario households should never have to choose between heating and eating just because of the federal Liberals' carbon tax. It is shameful that the majority of Liberal members have once again demonstrated that they j just don't care about affordability by voting against our government's carbon tax motions, even after they themselves had suggested they would support this very same measure. Speaker, through you, can the minister please elaborate on how the federally imposed carbon tax negatively impacts the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Speaker, once again, the Ontario Liberals are just proving that they're not serious about making life more affordable for the people of Ontario. And we saw that in real time for 15 years when they were the government of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They kept making it more expensive to live in Ontario. And you'll recall the phrase heat or eat and energy poverty, and it's part of the reason why the Ontario Liberal Caucus has been reduced to the minibus party, Mr. Speaker, and they continue to make the same stupid decisions that they made back in those days, Mr. Speaker. They're driving up the price of people across Ontario, and they have members that are standing up and saying that the carbon tax is making life easier for the people of Ontario than before the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. It's ludicrous. These Liberals are all about playing politics, Mr. Speaker, while our government is doing everything that we can, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that life is more affordable for the people of Ontario. And that includes Bonds. our government House Leader's motion to remove the harmonized sales tax from home heating fuel for all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. Speaker, yesterday the Premier said the people of Ontario don't give two hoots about his government's attempt to carve up the Green Belt, but I disagree, and so do hundreds of people who signed petitions and joined rallies to oppose this government's decisions. I imagine also Ontario's Auditor General, the Integrity Commissioner, and the RCMP would disagree. So, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. How can the Premier say people don't care about his government's shady Green Belt deal? when it was public pressure that forced him to reverse the policy in the first place. Right. From, again, I'm going to caution the member on her choice of words. Government House Leader and Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, what the Premier was saying yesterday was how important it is for the Legislative of Assembly of Ontario and for the Government of Ontario to focus on the priorities of the people of, of Ontario. Now, those priorities include affordability. Those priorities include building homes. Uh, uh, the people of the province of Ontario are worried about the increasing interest rates. Now, today is a day where the federal government is, at 4 o'clock, a fiscal update, which will include presumably measures which will either hurt or harm the economy of the country. And have the NDP asked even one question on the economy? We're now, what, 40 minutes, as uh, you said, 40 minutes into, uh, into question period, and the NDP have yet to ask a question on the economy because they don't care about Order. the people of the province of Ontario. What they care about is ensuring that people are dependent on government. It is an overriding theme for them. Well, we want to give people the tools to succeed. They want people to be dependent on government, Mr. Speaker. We're going to do what we think is right, cut taxes so that more people have money Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, try as they might, the government can't keep hiding from the public. 
They're blocking the public from being heard on this important bill. They've only allowed for one hour of committee hearings to discuss the green belt reversals, and the minister plans to use it up all by himself. It sure looks like the government is intentionally blocking the public from participating at committee. So, are you doing this to avoid being held accountable by the public for preferential treatment of the Greenbelt special speculator friends? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Straight. When the bill was in front of the House, you know what happened? Again, when the dining room closed downstairs, the vote collapsed and the NDP went home. They left hours of debate on the table for the bill. They're upset that the public doesn't have an opportunity, according to them. Order. According to them, the public doesn't have an opportunity to speak, but the public elected them to come here and speak on their behalf. And if they're so upset about it, you think Order. they could carry debate for more than an hour, Mr. Speaker? No, they couldn't, Mr. Speaker. That's why it collapsed. And that's why we're going to go to committee. We will spend the time at committee. It is listed on the uh, environmental registry right now. People have the opportunity to comment, Mr. Speaker. If they are against the changes that we are making, Speaker, they will have that opportunity to say so in, in committee. But we will continue on to provide the maximum protection of the green belt, despite the fact that they never Response. did it. This party will stand up for the green belt. We will stand up for the environment. And we'll Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Thank you. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, in January, this government forced the walk-in clinic in Mallory Town to close after they changed how virtual clinics bill OHIP. It was the only one of its kind in Leeds Granville. Over a thousand rural residents were left without another option. In April, a funding application was submitted for a nurse practitioner-led clinic, another option for rural residents. An announcement was supposed to be made in September, and then October, and then the fall economic statement. Crickets. The mayor just called it a very deathly silence. In the meantime, you've still got rural Ontarians without access to primary care. More people and more complex problems crowd the Brockville Emergency Room. How many times is this kind of thing being repeated in rural and northern Ontario? Mr. Speaker, innovative ideas for primary care are ready to roll across the province. Why can't this government make up its mind and get rural Ontarians access to primary care? Thank you. To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. I'm, I am absolutely thrilled that the member opposite is finally talking about an expansion of primary care in the province of Ontario, an initiative that our government brought forward and he voted against. So to suggest that we are in any way delaying this expansion is a complete fallacy. We are assessing all of those expression of interest. And I will say, Speaker, there are some wonderful examples of innovation that we will be able to expand primary care, the first primary care expansion of multidisciplinary teams in the province's history. Very happy to do it. I'm finally pleased that the member opposite is on board and supporting it. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Yes. What? What do I have to do? Withdraw. Supplementary question. Speaker, they're still waiting. 
Now, uh, before I ask my question, the minister is probably going to make up uh, some attack on the Liberal record in her answer to this uh, supplemental question. So let me just say here Order. that the first nurse practitioner-led clinic in Canada was in 2007, Governor, side, suffering in the first term of a Liberal government. Team-based primary care began in 2005 in the first term of a Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, the government's MPP for Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes has been standing up and asking about this critically important rural health care issue in this legislature. So to the minister, why does the Liberal MP ne MPP next door have to fight for health care in rural communities? Minister of Health. I don't know. Maybe your leadership candidate isn't going so well. I don't know. What I know is primary care expansion in the province of Ontario is expanding. We are assessing those expression of interest. We have literally received hundreds of applications. We're seeing innovation. We're seeing partnership. We're seeing community care health care centres coming forward and showing that they can help and be part of the solution. We'll continue to do that work. We want to make sure that primary care expansion is absolutely at the core of how we are improving health care services in the province of Ontario. But I have to say, Ontario still is leading Canada in the number of people who have connections with the primary care clinician. We're at 90% in Ontario. These are not my numbers. These come from Kai Hai, but we're going to do better Bonds. with this most recent announcement of primary care expansion. Thank you. The next question, the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, what's clear, Speaker, is that the carbon tax is not working to reduce emissions. However, the carbon tax is working to drive up inflation and make the products we need every day even more expensive. Businesses across Ontario are forced to pay this tax instead of making investments to expand their workforce by hiring more workers. It's not right, Speaker, that this federally imposed regressive tax is making it difficult for, difficult for businesses to innovate and grow. There are other ways to reduce emissions without this useless tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting businesses to strengthen economic growth and curb emissions? Great question. To respond, Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, the member from Whitby, the great member, is absolutely right. There is a better way. I talked about it last week, and it's around carbon capture utilization and storage. One of the great things we're doing here in Ontario to make this province a, a global leader in reducing emissions. Speaker, you know, we can do this by creating jobs and creating opportunity. And, you know, Enbridge appeared at a committee last spring and, and they said the path to net zero in Ontario is achievable by 2050. And the most cost effective, reliable, and resilient approach is one where CCS is expected to play a key role. Critical for industry, communities, and governments to continue working together to create the right frameworks to support CCS opportunities in Ontario. Opportunities like creating low carbon hydrogen. Speaking the way isn't to drill into the wallets of Ontarian families. The way is to make sure that we're creating jobs for Ontarians every day while meeting our obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's what we're doing through my ministry. That's what this government is doing every single day. Every day. Supplementary question. Uh, back to the minister. As he explained, the investments that our government is making will support job creation and reduce emissions. It's clear that carbon capture technology is just one way that our government has supported job creators and our shared goal of reducing emissions. Investments in job creation and innovation are key, Speaker, to building a better Ontario. Many sectors have great potential to integrate new technology that will significantly reduce emissions. That's why it's so concerning that the independent Liberals and the opposition, NDP, insist on supporting this job-killing and regressive tax. <laughs> Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the importance of enabling the technology that is essential for reducing emissions in Ontario? 
Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you again, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. You know, I think it's incredibly exciting what we're doing across many government ministries here in Ontario. And we've heard from the Minister of Energy about the steps that they're taking to make sure that we continue to produce clean energy in Ontario, expanding the nuclear fleet. Last week, I talked about the great work of the Minister of Mines. Well, I love looking at the Minister of Mines. He's excited to go to work every day and make sure that we build that road to the Ring of Fire, make sure we extract those metals, make sure that we build the EV battery capital here in Ontario, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade on the case every day. Mr. Speaker, we know in Ontario that it's not about taking money from Ontarians and saying, oh, trust us, we'll give it back to you later. It's about creating jobs. It's about meeting our obligations. We are focused on that. We are doing it every single day. We'll continue to do it every day. I'm hoping at 4 p.m. today the federal Bots. government realizes Realizes that and takes the opportunity to get rid of that carbon tax. Stop the clock. <laughs> Members will please take their seats. Order. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Last week, Infrastructure Ontario announced that Collier's project leaders would continue to provide project management services for the province's real estate assets. In 2017, the Auditor General criticized Infrastructure Ontario's previous procurement of project management services. She said the procurement had been structured in a way that favoured large companies like Collier's. They were the, there were only three bids for two massive contracts. The new Collier's mega contract appears to be even bigger. What is the value of the new Collier's mega contract, and how many eligible bids did Infrastructure Ontario receive? Reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm happy to speak about some of the efforts that we're doing uh, to improve real estate management in the province, such as the bill. Uh, that will be before the House this afternoon in terms of centralizing real estate assets um, and having better oversight and a sightline into the use of our real estate Order. so that we can address some of the most pressing challenges in society that we're facing today, like housing, affordable housing and long-term care. Very happy to speak about that further. Thank you, Speaker. The Auditor General's 2017 report also pointed out that Infrastructure Ontario and its embedded private contractors do a terrible job at managing the province's real estate assets. The permanent presence of embedded private contractors within Infrastructure Ontario means public dollars keep going towards private profits instead of keeping Ontario's public buildings in a state of good repair. Why is the Premier wasting money by maintaining a permanent presence of embedded private contractors within Infrastructure Ontario? instead of bringing this core function back in-house to be delivered by civil servants who are accountable to the public and not to private shareholders. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, well, in regards to the legislation that I will be speaking to today, we are in fact listening to the recommendations made by the AG back in 20, uh, 2017, where they said that government needs to be more innovative, be more efficient in terms of managing real estate assets. We're doing that, Mr. Speaker, through the legislation, through centralization, through a holistic approach to make sure that we manage our properties better. But, Mr. Speaker, there are also other things that we are doing to make sure that we make greater use of public lands through our surplus properties, um, whether it be for economic development, long-term care, uh, and housing opportunities across the province. So, Mr. Speaker, our government is taking action, and we are doing more with our real estate assets. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Hey, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I was at uh, three Santa Claus parades this weekend, and a resounding theme came up from people who were talking to me, and it was about affordability and the challenges That's that they're right. having in the rural part of, of Ontario. So, Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. As winter approaches, our government continues to take action on measures to make life more affordable for home heating. Yes. Speaker, our government continues to advocate on behalf of Ontarians to the federal government to walk back the disastrous carbon tax. It's played a key role in driving up inflation. We're looking to the other parties in this legislature for their support by asking the federal government to scrap the carbon tax, or at least cut the federal HST from home heating. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy please share his views on the urgency of financial relief for Ontarians 
when it comes to the carbon tax. Oh. To reply, the Minister of Energy. To the member from uh, Peterborough Kawartha for the question this morning. It's an important one, and he's right. This is what people are talking about on the streets in our communities is the affordability crisis that's going on right now, where people are having uh, to choose between heating and eating in some cases, Mr. Speaker. While we have put lots of different affordability measures in the window, Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate uh, that um, the opposition Liberals here in Ontario continue to support their federal cousins in imposing a carbon tax, which, according to the Bank of Canada, according to the parliamentary budget officers, driving up the cost of everything, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to say exactly which member it was uh, earlier when I was answering a question about the carbon tax, indicated that we, we care more about uh, bicycles in Ontario and riding bicycles than we do about driving, Mr. Speaker. There are a lot of people outside of this city that drive vehicles, Mr. Speaker, and it's costing them more and more to drive vehicles. If this Ontario Liberal Party isn't careful, they're not going to be the minibus party or the minivan party. They're going to be the bicycle built for two, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. That's, a, that's an excellent point. When the uh, grocery store in Apsley burnt, it's a 55-kilometer drive to get to the nearest grocery store, so I'm wow. not sure how you do that on a bicycle. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his great answer, though. And it's clear from the minister's response that support from the NDP is tentative at best and really kind of fails to offer actual help for Ontarians. Well, it appears the NDP are at least interested in supporting the ins installation of heat pumps to help reduce the cost of home heating and emissions. They kind of missed the mark on supporting the cost-saving energy programs that our government has implemented. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is supporting the people of Ontario with cost-saving energy initiatives? Minister of Energy. Well, thank you uh, to the member opposite for the question. This time I will address uh, the meat of uh, the question that he's asking, Mr. Speaker. We, we have several uh, programs that we put forward, including the Ontario Electricity Rebate, the Comprehensive Electricity Plan, cutting uh, the price of gasoline by 10 cents a litre, Mr. Speaker. We have the Clean Home Heating Initiative, which is also making heat pumps available in communities uh, across the province, Mr. Speaker. These are hybrid heat pumps that will allow people to reduce their use of natural gas and still at the same time uh, heat their home using electricity. We're putting all of these measures on the table, Mr. Speaker. The NDP's plan uh, to give heat pumps to everybody is uncosted. They said it would cost less than a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. It's that kind of half-baked policy uh, that is going to result in massive, massive over-expenditures. You know, if we were to give everybody that's on natural gas or home heating or propane in the province a free heat Response. pump, Mr. Speaker, you know, our back of the napkin math would be somewhere in the neighbourhood of $16 billion. You can't afford the NDP, and the Liberals won't stand up for the people of Ontario. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, and my question is to the Premier. Uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks, the NDP, the official opposition, have put forward two motions that would make life more affordable for Ontarians. Uh, both of these motions have been shut down by this government. Last week, we tabled a motion simply calling for a clear timeline and clear firm funding commitment uh, for the expanded two-way all-day go train service between Kitchener and Toronto. Uh, the business case for this is very sound, but the government chose to vote against that motion, Mr. Speaker, even though in 2018 and in 2022 this Premier promised the people of Kitchener-Waterloo that, that he would get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, this Premier uh, also has a candidate in Kitchener in the by-election right now, and when they announced him, they promised to deliver two-way all-day go service. I wonder how this candidate feels now that the government has voted down a firm funding commitment and a firm plan question. for two-way all-day go. So my question is very simple to the Premier of Ontario. Why does he keep leaving the people of Kitchener-Waterloo behind, stranded at the station? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, there has been no government in the history of this province that has done more for public transit than this yeah. government under the leadership of Premier Ford. In fact, Mr. Speaker, on the Kitchener line, we have increased service by over 27% since 2020, 
And guess what, Mr. Speaker? That member from Waterloo has voted against every single oh, one of those service oh, increases. Oh, this oh, government God. has been committed to making uh, sure the happen. tunnels are built to ensure that we can have all-way two-way go uh, across the Kitchener line. But then again, when we put those uh, investments forward uh, in this House, in, in, the, in the budget, that member oh. stands up every single time and votes no. Oh. Votes no for expansion of Go Rail Transit across this province, specifically on the Kitchener line, and says no to the people of Waterloo for better Response. public transit. The supplementary question. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, to the member from Brampton South, I would like to remind him that there has never been a government in the history of this province with a criminal investigation from the RCMP. <laughs> People do care about that. People do care about that. So, Speaker, Order. just yesterday we saw that this government again vote no to a measure Order. that would benefit the lives of Ontarians. I don't know. I can't hear myself. Uh, the NDP motion to make heat pumps uh, subsidized, actually in cooperation with the federal government, to help Ontarians with uh, energy-saving retrofits was, was the only solution so far put forward in this House uh, to tackle affordability and climate change. Uh, this would create good local jobs. It would address the underground economy. It would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's a good idea. Uh, but this government is uh, not going to go down that road, um, Speaker. The, our proposal actually would make uh, so much more, more efficient and lower people's energy bills. To the Premier, why does this government continue to vote against the interests of the people that we are elected to serve in Ontario? Parliamentary assistant and uh, member for Kitchener Conestoga to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I find it rich coming for someone who has actually um, had an integrity commissioner investigation once against her and was found guilty of what she was accused from. Order. But let's talk. Let's talk Order. a little bit about what we've done for Kitchener. We're building a new Order. hospital in Kitchener, Mr. Speaker. We're building Highway 7, Mr. Speaker, between Kitchener and Guelph. We are seeing incredible investments when it comes to Go Train service in the region. In fact, we've increased service almost 100 per cent since 2018 wow. when we took office. So I'm extremely proud to be part of a government that is putting, putting Waterloo Region first, not like this member who sits across, votes no, Order. we're going to get it done for the people of Kitchener. Yeah. Stop the clock. Member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. The government house leader will come to order. The Minister of Education will come to order. No, that was me. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. The carbon tax means rising prices for everything. It's costing every sector in Ontario more on every single thing they grow, produce, manufacture, and transport. We've heard from the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs, the Minister of Transportation, and others about the negative impact of the carbon tax on our economy and environment. 
Speaker, our government is finding solutions to reduce emissions while supporting job creators. That's why it's so disappointing that the independent Liberals and opposition NDP continue to support the federal carbon tax. That's true. Shame. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how innovative approaches to reduce emissions will support Ontario's economy and environment? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And you know, I've had the, the chance to speak about some of those innovations today. You know, it strikes me, Speaker, that the carbon tax is a little bit like a, a bad movie written by the Liberals and our friends over here in the opposition called Groundhog Day 2. Yeah. Only in this movie, Bill Murray wakes up every day with a full wallet, and by the end of the day, all the money's gone because he had to pay carbon tax on buying gas, on buying groceries, and on paying his heating bill. Well, Speaker, I can tell you that this caucus is prepared to do a rewrite on that script here, here. and turn this into a movie with a happy ending. We're working at it every Every single day for the people of Ontario. It's easy to write a good movie, Speaker. The Liberals need to give us a hand to do it. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.